Securing and accessing your non-relational data is not all that different from securing and accessing any other resource in Microsoft Azure. And it shares a lot of similarities with the relational data stores that we've talked about, but also it has some of its own nuances, in particular the user authentication stuff. So let's first talk about the ways we securely access our data stores, our NoSQL data stores inside of Microsoft Azure. And that's gonna include data encryption at the data level, user authentication at the service level, and then networking and firewalls at the network communication level, of course. So how does this work? Well, data encryption, we've talked about a little bit. That is fairly straightforward. Data encryption is standard for Azure Cosmos DB. It is turned on so the data is always encrypted, what we refer to as at rest. And that means that the data is stored on Microsoft Azure storage devices is encrypted using either service managed keys or customer managed keys. So those keys can either be managed internally by Microsoft Azure or you can manage them yourself, but that data is always encrypted at rest. And all communication, all network communication that happens with your Azure Cosmos DB happens over HTTPS, which means that it is also encrypted in transit. So with Azure Cosmos, your data is always encrypted at rest and in transit. No holds barred. There's no way to turn that off or disable that. For your storage accounts, you can very easily turn on data encryption at rest, although you are able to disable it in certain circumstances for certain things. Now, you're always still using HTTPS for in-transit encryption with storage, so Azure Storage is also always encrypted in transit. You cannot access it through an unencrypted channel. But as far as at rest or storage encryption, well, that's a choice that you can make. And if you watched my video on deploying Azure Storage, you'll recall that we added the encryption flag for our blob storage. Taking a look at this inside of the user interface, let's bring up our Cosmos account. The only real option here, if we scroll down on the left to keys, we can see here, these are the storage keys that are associated with my account. I chose service to manage keys when I set this up. So I don't have any way to manage or do anything else with these keys other than regenerate them if I want. I will talk about key regeneration in a moment, but you can see that these keys are really locked down. They're managed and maintained by Microsoft Azure, specifically by the Cosmos DB service, and these are simply used to access my Cosmos database if I want to. The other service that we talked about is storage, and in our storage accounts, we can see that there is actually an encryption tab as well. In that encryption tab, we have the option between Microsoft Managed Keys or Customer Managed Keys. So we can switch over to our own user managed keys. You see that if we do this here, we have to enter a key URI and get them out of a key vault. So we can manage them in our own way. Typically, it's easier to let Microsoft manage them. And you can see when I set this up, I chose support for Customer Managed Keys on blobs and files only. My infrastructure encryption, if you hover over this I, is a second layer of encryption that we can choose to add but it can only be enabled during storage account creation. I did not enable that, so it is disabled permanently for this account. If I created a new account, however, I could enable that if I so chose. Now, on top of data encryption, we have to look at user access, user authentication. And this is where Azure's non-relational databases actually differ a little bit from the relational data stores. Because the relational data stores are sort of legacy systems largely, and they have a long history of operating and being built outside the confines of Microsoft Azure, they all have their own internal user authentication systems. So we saw this a little bit when we were setting up things like Postgres or MySQL inside of Azure. We had to create users on that database, users on that database software, and those users had to be managed inside of that database software and granted access to different portions of that database, all inside of that database service. Now there is a little chain, we didn't necessarily explore it, where you can allow Azure to manage its own users and grant them access to Azure SQL databases in their platform as service. That's only because Microsoft owns both Azure and SQL Server, and so it's been able to marry those two somewhat closely, but you're still at the end of the day largely relying on internal database users. That is not the case with the relational data services. With both Azure Storage and Azure Cosmos DB, we are managing those users using the Microsoft Azure user management tool. We call it IAM, Identity and Access Management. So the way this works is all of the users that have access to an Azure account are stored inside of Azure Active Directory, as well as any groups that exist inside of your Azure account. You create those inside of Azure Active Directory and users can be made members of those groups. And then permissions can be granted directly to the different entities, either users or groups, using something called role-based access control, RBAC. Now, RBAC is a pretty interesting little topic. It's generally a way that you should organize or architect your security, and I'll talk through it very, very quickly. 
Imagine if you wanted to grant permissions to a user to do something, say read some data out of your Cosmos DB. You might say, well, I would open up the system that I manage user permissions in, I would find that user and I would add, um, edit or read data from this Cosmos database to that user. That makes sense, right? And that's perfectly fine, but that doesn't necessarily scale very well. If you need to add a whole bunch of permissions to one user, that can take some time. If you need to add a whole bunch of permissions to a whole bunch of users, man, that's going to take even longer when you need to manage and revoke permissions and update them and change them. It's a big deal. So enter RBAC. With RBAC, we separate out our users and our permissions and we use groups in between them. So over here are my users and over here are my permissions. And instead of granting permissions to users, I create groups and users get associated with groups. So those two users might be associated with that group. And uh, you know what, these three users might be associated with this group. Permissions can then get granted to the groups individually. And what this allows me to do is both wholesale manage the permissions that an individual user has. If I want the user to lose the permissions of this group, I just take them out of that group or manage the permissions that a, an individual group has. I can do the same thing with permissions. So you can create groups that represent roles to access your system and you use those groups. So you assign permissions and users to those groups and that's how the permissions ultimately get assigned to the users. This is called role-based access control, RBAC. And you can see this also very easily inside of the user interface. Uh, we're on the storage account here already. Let's click access control IAM. First thing I can do here is I can click view my access. And this shows me the current user that I'm logged in as, my uh, administrator account what access I have. Notice up here, role, storage, blob, data contributor. If you were watching the video on deploying this storage account, you recall that I had to create that role on my user before I could create a container and upload a blob. This is where it's reflected in the user interface. I granted this permission, this role to my user, storage, blob, data contributor. I did not grant a specific permission. The permissions are granted to this role, but by virtue of being a member of this role, I now had access to use this and notice the scope is this resource to contribute blobs to this storage container. The description allows for read, write, delete access. If I wanted to work on something else, I can grant access to this resource here, add role assignments. These are all the different roles that I can choose from that are associated with a storage account. So I could add a storage data blob reader. And the little I there tells me, gives me a quick hint about what this particular role does. Here I can choose what I'm specifically going to assign this role to, and I'm going to assign it to a user group or service principal. And then here on the bottom are all my users and groups that exist inside of my Azure Active Directory. So for instance, here I could create a new group called read CBT sample storage permissions. And then any user that I wanted to have the ability to read those permissions, I would make them a member of that role. And any user that I wanted to revoke, I would simply remove them from membership in that role. Role-based access assignment. The same thing exists over here on my CBT Cosmos account. Over here, I am access control. View my access, well, I don't have anything other than service administrator that gives me full access to this resource. But again, we can create role assignments. The roles, they have different assignments like Cosmos DB instead of storage account reader and writer. And again, I can grant those to different users or groups and grant users permissions that way to this service. So that's an important difference to understand. We are not dealing with internal service user accounts like we do with the relational data services. With the non-relational data services, we are dealing with the Azure service accounts, the Azure user accounts, and all the permission is handled through Azure IAM, Identity and Access Management. Another feature that I mentioned I wanna talk about are the storage access keys. We saw those access keys briefly, but simply the access keys allow you to use them sort of like passwords to access your storage, your non-relational data. They should be stored securely and never shared with anyone unless they have to be. They should also be regenerated regularly. I'll show you how to do that. And there's usually two keys and we use that so we can have zero downtime recycling. Let me explain what I mean there. Imagine that you have a bunch of services that are relying on accessing this storage account using one of those keys and it's time to regenerate it. Well, you regenerate the key. You've got to go to each of those services and replace it with the new key that you've regenerated because the old one is now no longer valid. And that's a problem, right? Until you get to that service and replace its key, it's not going to be able to access the storage. That service will not work appropriately. Instead, what you do is you always have two active keys at any one point in time and you reverse the order. When it's time to regenerate the keys, you go to all your service and you change their key from one to two. So they work the entire time. They're using key one, that works fine. You open up the service, change it to key two, and it still continues to work. Once you've done that to all your services, then you can regenerate key one. When no one is any, no longer using key one, you regenerate key one. 
And that way, if it happens to have ever been compromised or lost or stolen, you know that anyone who lost or stole key one, well, that no longer grants them access to the service. You then wait until it's time to regenerate key two and you repeat that process. You go to those services, you replace the key two with the new key one that you regenerated earlier. Once all the key twos are no longer in use, you can regenerate key two and back and forth. So having two keys is an important part of your recycling operation. And we saw how easy that was to do here inside of the keys page. Uh, here on, for instance, on the Cosmos account, you can see there's my primary key and there's my secondary key. Those are my two different keys that I might use. And if I want to regenerate one, I just open this up, click regenerate key. And this is going to generate a new primary key for me to access this service. At this point, anyone who was using the old primary key to access this service would no longer have access. So again, use your secondary keys, your two keys in order to manage that recycling and that regeneration. When it comes to network access, there's really just three ways that you're going to access it, either all networks, both public and private, or specified networks, which includes both Azure virtual networks and firewall rules, or something called private endpoints. Let's take a brief look at each of these. When I come over here on my, for instance, my Azure storage account to firewall and virtual networks, when I set this up, if you were watching that video, I allowed all that networks access to this. This means that it's basically wide open access to anyone who has well, the appropriate credentials, right? They need those storage keys or they need to be signed in to a user account that has access through IAM, but otherwise they're not being blocked in any way by network traffic. We could filter this down more and you probably should filter this down more to selected networks using this radio button here. You see the page gets a lot more complicated when I do that. What I can do is I can add existing virtual networks that are inside my Azure account and I, that will grant those virtual networks access to this service. So I can grant individual virtual networks that exist inside of Azure to the service. I can also add specific IP address ranges. So if I want to allow, for instance, my on-premises computer, well, add my current IP address range, that's going to add my IP address range to the firewall and allow this connection through to the service. Now, this does not, of course, allow me to uh, access the database if I don't have a service key or an IAM access. I still need to be authenticated against the service in order to actually access the data. This is simply network communication. Is the network going to allow a connection from my IP address, from my source, or from the source inside of the virtual network to connect to this service? Importantly, when you're considering firewall access, remember your own service firewalls as well. If you are in any sort of enterprise deployment, you likely have firewalls that are monitoring or blocking outbound traffic. So if there is issues connecting to a service, consider the fact that your own firewalls may be blocking your outbound connections, even if you have the firewall on the service set appropriately to allow you. The other thing that I mentioned there are private endpoint connections, and these are really outside the scope of these videos, but a private endpoint connection would allow you to effectively add this service account into an Azure virtual subnet, making it a member of that subnet. At that point, everyone inside of that virtual subnet would be able to directly connect to this account. You wouldn't have to allow that subnet in the other page inside of your virtual network page. You've simply added this service or this resource to that subnet, a way to make it a member of the same subnet. And that way, any sort of network traffic monitoring or security or service that, is, that exists inside of that subnet will apply to this service as well. So that is quite a bit about how you set up and secure and manage your connectivity to your non-relational SQL services. Obviously, we covered a lot here. We didn't dive deeply into any of them. I just want to make sure that you're aware that each of these properties exists and where you find access to them and how you can configure them. Any that you need to know more about, check out the documentation. Microsoft has great documentation on all of that. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.